you start it, let me know. Okay, so, so today we're starting our chapter on uh, nucleic acids. We're going to be covering uh, DNA and RNA, which are types of nucleic acids. Uh, and we're going to begin uh, with a discussion of nucleic acids and their structures. Uh, and then we will talk about various processes that uh, nucleic acids are involved in, replication, transcription, and translation. Uh, so this is material that you may very well have covered in uh, biology classes or, or even in a class in high school. Um, we're going to take a chemical approach here, uh, right, because this is a chemistry class, an organic chemistry class, so we're going to focus on the structures, uh, we're going to focus on the non-covalent interactions that, uh, that are important for those structures, we're going to focus on the chemistry that is involved uh, in these processes, so it might be a little different approach uh, from what you are, uh, what you've had in a biology class, and um, uh, we will follow the Today we'll cover probably two thirds to three quarters of this chapter, and then we'll just finish up the last couple topics on Monday before we go into uh, our metabolism chapter. So nucleic acids are uh, biopolymers. We've had two other types of biopolymers we've learned about, uh, carbohydrates and, uh, pep and proteins. And so this is our third type of biopolymer. Uh, and the monomers that make up nucleic acids are known as nucleotides uh, and what the, the role of our nucleic acids in nature uh, is to store genetic information. Uh, that's what our DNA does. Uh, and then also to translate that information into proteins. And that is the role of RNA. So we'll talk about both of those. Uh, and there are three components to a uh, nucleotide, which is the building block, the monomer that is used to make a nucleic acid. And so the first one is a monosaccharide. And that monosaccharide is going to be a pentose, an aldopentose. Uh, and there are two of them, as you're probably aware, that are used as building blocks for nucleic acids, okay? Uh, so which one is this? Okay, that is ribose. That is D-ribose. So D-ribose is the monosaccharide that is used to make up RNA. Uh, and then we have its relative. It's uh, deoxy sugar. And this is, I've drawn it as the beta. Beta D-ribo. Uh, furanoside is what it would actually be, or furanose, beta deribofuranose is what, uh, what I've drawn here, uh, because it is uh, when it forms N-glycosides uh, to form uh, nucleosides and nucleotides, uh, it is in the beta form. Uh, and then this one is 2' prime deoxyribose, missing the 2' prime OH group of ribose. So these monosaccharides are one component uh, of a nucleotide, the monomer that is used uh, to form DNA. The second component is the heterocyclic base shown here. Uh, so these are all aromatic heterocycles. We touched on this a little bit uh, when we were learning about uh, aromatic compounds. Even though uh, many of these uh, bases are not drawn uh, with an aromatic resonance structure. They all have aromatic resonance structures and therefore they are uh, aromatic uh, species. Uh, and they're based on, there are five of them, right? There's uh, uh, uracil is only present in RNA. Thymine is only present in DNA. They differ by uh, simply a methyl group. Uh, and these five uh, heterocyclic bases are based on two parent heterocyclic ring systems. We have our pyrimidines, so pyrimidine is like pyridine. It kind of sounds like pyridine, uh, but it has an extra nitrogen uh, in, the, uh, in the ring. Uh, and then you have a purine, uh, which is a bicyclic uh, heterocycle. Uh, and you see the, the, the heterocycles that are based on those. Okay, so um, as far as knowing these structures go, uh, it's going to be kind of like the, um, what we did with the lipids, where... Um, 
Uh, we're probably not going to ask you to draw these things from scratch, but uh, you should be able to recognize the, you should be able to, if you're given the structures and the names, you should be able to match structures and names. If you see a structure, you should be able to say, okay, that's cytosine or this is guanine. Uh, so you should know these, uh, maybe not quite as uh, in depth as the carbohydrates and the amino acids, uh, is what we're asking you to do uh, with these heterocyclic bases, okay? Uh, any questions about our uh, bases of uh, DNA and RNA? Okay. Uh, and then there is a third component. Uh, well, before we go into that third component, when we combine our heterocyclic bases and our monosaccharides, uh, we get something that is known as a nucleoside. Okay. So there's much like our lipids chapter and our carbohydrates chapter, there's a lot of vocabulary in this nucleic acids chapter. So a nucleoside is simply an N-glycoside. You learned about N-glycosides at the end of our carbohydrate chapter. So a nucleoside is an N-glycoside uh, between either ribose or deoxyribose in one of those five aromatic heterocycles, okay? So one of the nitrogens, uh, and if we go back to our slide showing the bases, uh, you can see that the nitrogens in red are the ones that are bonding to the monosaccharide to form that N-glycoside. <clears throat> so here are our N-glycosides of ribose and deoxyribose, and they're always beta uh, in our nucleic acids. They're always going to be beta. So a nucleoside is what we get when we have uh, two of the three components uh, linked together. And then the final component of the monomers that, is, that are used to make uh, nucleic acids is the five prime phosphate. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that because we have numbering for both the monosaccharide and for the uh, base, the numbering for the base uses just regular numbers and the numbers with the primes after them are representing the numbers of the monosaccharide. And when we're numbering the monosaccharide, we start at the anomeric carbon uh, like we have when we've been numbering carbohydrates. So if we add a phosphate on the five prime position, uh, then that is known as a nucleotide, okay? So a nucleoside, S comes before T, so the nucleoside has two of the three components, and then you add the third component, and you get what is known as a nucleotide, okay? So this is a ribonucleotide, uh, because it's derived from ribose, uh, and then this is a deoxyribonucleotide uh, because it is derived from deoxyribose. And that phosphate is going to be on the five prime position. Um, the phosphate is typically drawn with two negative charges uh, because at physiological pH, the 7.4 pH, uh, then it would be deprotonated at these positions. The reason these polymers are known as nucleic acids is because they're based on phosphoric acid, uh, but it is the deprotonated form of phosphoric acid that would be uh, present at the, uh, the physiological pHs, okay? So, so this, uh, you're, you're gonna have a negative two charge on a nucleotide at uh, physiological pHs, okay? So you'll see some names here uh, that are used. Uh, the, these are the name. This is the naming system for our um, uh, our, our nucleotides. You name the the base. Uh, you put two prime deoxy in front if it is uh, uh, a deoxy ribonucleotide. And then here's the abbreviations. The the, the letter for the base is first, or, or there's a D if it's deoxy. Uh, and then the MP is standing for monophosphate. Okay, so those are. That's how we name our nucleotides. <clears throat> and then here we have a table uh, showing you how this is done. Um, again, I wouldn't put a ton of effort into memorizing this, but just understand how these names are derived because you might see the names uh, in exam questions and things like that, or you might see the abbreviations and you'll wanna know uh, what that represents, okay? Uh, any questions about our nucleotides and the individual components of nucleotides. Okay. All right, if there's no questions, let's see how well you have uh, learned the vocabulary so far. Uh, let's get out 
our eye clickers, and we have a molecule on the screen, and we're asking you to decide which of these four categories this molecule fits into. So you may go ahead and talk to your neighbors uh, to answer this question. Okay, let's uh, get those final answers in. Any more answers? Going once, going twice. Okay, what is this compound? Deoxy, no oxygen here, so it is a deoxyribonucleotide. Nucleotide because it contains all three ingredients. Deoxy because there's no oxygen there. Very good. Okay, so um, our our deoxy our uh, nucleotides are then linked together, uh, and they are linked together by bonds between the three prime OH of one nucleotide to the five five prime phosphate of another nucleotide, uh, and that's going to form a polymeric chain uh, known as a nucleic acid. Um, before we show you those, there's one more uh, item to show you on nucleotides, which is that there are other nucleotides that are actually not part of nucleic acids that are used for other purposes uh, in nature. Uh, and that is ADP and ATP are the most uh, prominent ones. So um, you can see that uh, ADP and ATP possess all the ingredients to be nucleotides, uh, meaning that um, it is not only monophosphates that count as nucleotides, but you can have diphosphates and triphosphates also uh, for something to be a nucleotide. And we're going to learn in our next chapter uh, how uh, ATP uh, is involved in uh, uh, energy um, uh, in the metabolism process in the body. So we do see uh, nucleotides. So these are ribonucleotides. They have ribose in them uh, as opposed to deoxyribose, but we do, we do see them uh, in nature as well. So um, our nucleic acid molecules can vary in size. Uh, DNA molecules are typically huge. A DNA molecule will usually have millions of nucleotides in it. So these are massive molecules, by far our largest uh, biomolecules uh, that we have. Uh, whereas our RNA molecules are comparatively smaller, they'll have a few thousand nucleotides, which is still pretty large, uh, but dwarfed by the size of uh, DNA. Um, and so DNA molecules are going to make up chromosomes, uh, and then any individual DNA molecule is going to have several genes uh, comprised as part of that molecule. So recognize uh, the DNA is massive, uh, RNA is still big, but not uh, nearly as big uh, as DNA. And so uh, the DNA, as you're aware, forms a double helix. You have two strands of DNA that are going to uh, twist in a right-handed helical fashion. Um, 
Before we look at that, we'll just look at what a, a, a single strand of the DNA would look like. Uh, and we typically use just the single letter abbreviations for the bases to uh, name a strand of DNA. And we're going to start at the five prime end. So the five prime end of a DNA strand is going to have a phosphate on it. Uh, and then you see these linkages, uh, these phosphoester linkages, uh, they each have one negative charge on them. Uh, and then you go down the chain and then at the three prime end, you're going to have a free alcohol. Okay, so this, uh, uh, this uh, strand of DNA just has four uh, nucleotides in it. Uh, and then here we have a molecular model showing you the double helix. Uh, the double helix has two anti-parallel strands, which means the strands are going in opposite directions. Uh, if we look at the, the, this uh, figure here, uh, the strand I'm pointing to now on the left, the five prime end is at the top and it's going from five prime to three prime. Uh, and then this one has the three prime end at the top. So it's, it's actually going up here. So that's what we mean by anti-parallel. Uh, and they kind of wind around each other. Uh, and each turn, each turn of one of the strands contains 10 base pairs, meaning that it's going to have 10 nucleotides on that strand, hydrogen bonded to uh, base pairs, complementary base pairs on the other strand. Okay, uh, those base pairs are held together by uh, hydrogen bonding. Uh, and we have here uh, kind of an expansion of one turn of that helix, uh, showing you the hydrogen bonding of DNA, uh, where A binds to T, uh, adenine and thymine, and then guanine and cytosine, hydrogen bonding to each other. Uh, the, the heterocyclic bases are complementary to each other, uh, because G and C can form three hydrogen bonds uh, to each other, uh, whereas A and T uh, can only form two hydrogen bonds. So we have this complementary system uh, that uh, causes uh, one base of DNA to hydrogen bond to just one of the other bases, uh, A and T pairing up, uh, C and G pairing up, okay? Uh, and then these turns, cause two grooves to form, right? So there's two grooves. If we look at the backbone, uh, we have two grooves. Uh, and uh, because of the shape of the helix, the grooves are of different sizes. Uh, we have a large groove and a smaller groove. And this is known as the major groove. This is known as the minor groove uh, of the uh, nucleic acid polymer, okay? Uh, any questions about the structure of the double helix? Okay, you've probably all heard this, heard this before. So uh, there is another type of non-covalent force. This is something you may not have heard before. Uh, there's another type of non-covalent force that holds the double helix together in addition to hydrogen bonding. Uh, and that is known as pi stacking. Okay. The book alluded to pi stacking or briefly mentioned it back in chapter 19 when we were learning about aromatic chemistry, but it fits better here because pi stacking plays a role in stabilizing the double helix. So pi stacking simply refers to having two pi systems stacked one on top of the other, okay? Uh, and if you look at the structure of the double helix, you see that these uh, hydrogen bonded base pairs kind of form rungs of a ladder and they're stacked one on top of the each of, of each other. And there, there are some in, in they're intramolecular in this case. Uh, well, I guess you could say intra and inter because there are two different strands. These are non-covalent attractive forces that are holding those base pairs in the proper position. Okay. So you might wonder how can pi systems attract each other? They're both electron rich. Shouldn't they repel each other? Okay, hopefully that's something you're thinking about because yes, that's what you would expect is uh, pi systems to repel each other. Well, it depends on how they're oriented. If you were to have two benzene rings stacked directly on top of each other, I'm gonna use the shading that we used with Hayworth projections to indicate that this benzene ring is really supposed to be perpendicular uh, to the screen or to, to the chalkboard here. If we had two benzene rings directly stacked one on top of the other, that would be destabilizing. We, we would refer to this as a sandwich. 
right? It would be like a benzene sandwich if we had something in between. Probably wouldn't taste very good. But um, those pi electrons would repel each other if you had them stacked directly on top of each other. So the way pi stacking occurs in a stabilizing effect is when those aromatic rings are offset from each other. So we could draw one benzene ring like this. And then we could draw another benzene ring offset. Let me move it over just a little bit more. Okay. And this arrangement is known as parallel offset. Benzene rings are parallel to each other, but they're not stacked one on top of, the, of each other. They're offset. This is a stabilizing interaction. The reason is, if they're parallel offset, one or more of the hydrogens of one benzene ring are going to be located underneath the pi electrons of the other benzene ring. Okay, The pi electrons of a benzene ring have a partial positive charge uh, because an sp2 carbon is more electronegative than an sp3 carbon, the electrons in these sp2 carbon hydrogen sigma bonds are pulled towards the benzene ring. So because these hydrogens have a partial positive charge, they're going to be attracted to that cloud of pi electrons either above or below. So when you have uh, aromatic rings stacked in a parallel offset fashion, you have an attractive force. And that's what's known as pi stacking. And that's what occurs in the uh, double helix structure of DNA because those, uh, those base pairs, those rungs of the ladder are twisted relative to each other. There is a parallel offset arrangement and there is a stabilizing non-covalent interaction. Okay. Any questions about pi stacking? Okay. So this is an important part. Yes. Uh, there may be slight differences, but uh, we'll just treat them all as being uh, stabilizing effects and not distinguish between them. <clears throat> so there are some anti-cancer drugs that interfere with uh, DNA uh, replication and other processes related to DNA that take advantage of this pi stacking phenomenon. Okay, and I'll show you one of them known as bleomycin. Bleomycin is a naturally occurring compound. It was isolated from some bacteria found in Japan uh, way back in the 1960s. Uh, bleomycin uh, is an interesting molecule. You can recognize many of its components. You can see that it has a disaccharide component. You can see that it's got some peptide structures. We've got a threonine here, a beta hydroxyhistidine. Um, and so we have some uh, peptide type structures some heterocycle type structures, and we have some carbohydrate type structures. Uh, but we have this bithiazole core. So um, thiazole is the name for this five-membered uh, heterocycle that has nitrogen and sulfur in it. So this part of the molecule is uh, very flat and rigid, and it's capable of intercalating. Intercalating means inserting itself into the minor groove of DNA. So these uh, flat aromatic rings can just slide in in between the base pairs and they can pi stack to those base pairs uh, and it can end up in the minor groove of DNA. You'll notice bleomycin also has a positively charged sulfonium ion. What do you think that positively charged sulfonium ion can interact with in the DNA double helix? The negatively charged phosphate backbone, exactly. So this part of the molecule is designed to intercalate into the minor groove and then interact with that negatively charged phosphate backbone. So here's a molecular model from a paper that was published years ago about bleomycin uh, showing you a bleomycin molecule intercalated into the minor groove of a double helix. So you've got pi stacking from our bithiazole portion, allowing it to insert and then you've got the yellow sulfur here, and you see that that is in close proximity to your phosphate backbone. So what that does, that intercalation, and as well as, so the pi stacking, as well as the electrostatic attraction, it positions 
the warhead part of the molecule, as we'll refer to it, which is this heterocycle right here, uh, this pyrimidine ring, it, it, it uh, positions that in close proximity to the backbone of DNA. And so what does this do? This heterocycle, this pyrimidine heterocycle, we'll go back so you can see it a little better on this figure, it binds to iron. Right? It has all these Lewis basic nitrogens. It's able to coordinate to a Lewis acidic iron. What have we seen iron do before in the context of hemoglobin and myoglobin? What does iron bind? It binds oxygen. Okay? So we bind an iron, which then binds an oxygen, and we deliver that oxygen to the backbone of DNA. Oxygen is a radical, remember? That radical oxygen abstracts a hydrogen atom from the backbone of the DNA. And what does that do to the DNA? It breaks the strands, okay? There are two mechanisms by which the strands, once you get a radical, so this is bleomycin, iron, oxygen complex. Once you get a radical in the backbone of the DNA, so this is at C4, it's abstracting uh, hydrogen from, from C4, uh, of that deoxyribose, uh, then it's able to fragment and break the strand into two pieces. So if you break the strands up, you break your DNA strands up, it cannot replicate. So this is how bleomycin kills cells. It's going to be toxic to all cells because all cells require DNA replication to reproduce. Uh, but because cancer cells reproduce much more rapidly than other cells, if you get the dosage right, uh, you can kill the cancer cells without killing too many of the regular cells. Okay. So bleomycin is an anti-cancer drug. We'll go back to its structure again. Uh, and a key part of its function is pi stacking. This bithiazole system intercalating into the minor groove of the DNA, uh, and then this electrostatic attraction between the sulfonium and the phosphate backbone, okay? Any questions about pi stacking or how uh, bleomycin functions? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, it's going to recognize a certain, because of its backbone, it's going to recognize certain sequences of DNA. I don't know this for sure, but it may be that the sequences it recognizes are overrepresented in the genomes of those types of cancers. I don't know for sure. That's just a, a hypothesis. But, uh, uh, but yes, it is not, does not kill all types of cancers, but... Um, uh, it is good for these. It's very good for testicular cancer. Uh, if you're a cycling buff and you know of Lance Armstrong, who was a famous cyclist many years ago, who uh, then got busted for using steroids, uh, he had testicular cancer, and bleomycin was one of the drugs that saved his life. Okay? Any other questions? All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how the replication of DNA occurs. So replication is the process by which a copy of DNA is, is made. Uh, and it's important to note that a DNA molecule, remember I said a DNA molecule has millions of nucleotides in it. It's huge. <clears throat> and so in the replication process, the entire DNA molecule is copied. Whereas in the transcription process, we'll talk about in a few moments, only a small part of the DNA is copied into RNA. So a small part of DNA is a gene. Usually 1% to 2% of a DNA molecule actually represents a genomic material. Uh, and so much smaller strands of RNA are produced in the transcription process. But in the replication, we're reproducing the entire million uh, nucleotide uh, DNA molecule. So how does that happen? Well, first thing we have to do is unwind our double helix, okay? And the unwinding process is much more complicated than it might seem. You cannot unwind a whole uh, double strand, uh, double helix. Uh, you can't unwind the entire thing. It's unwound a little bit at a time, progressing along that double helix, okay? So you're gonna get little bubbles, little unwound bubbles as you progress down uh, the DNA in this, um, this process of replication. Now, unwinding in small areas causes strain, right? This double helix is stable. So if you're unwinding it, you're going to introduce torsional strain. Uh, and this is not in the book, but it's also important. That torsional strain has to be relieved by temporarily cutting one of the two strands. So in that 
unwinding process, one of the two strands is going to be cut and temporarily opened. And there's an enzyme called topoisomerase. that is responsible for that cutting and then re-ligating of the strand, okay? Now there's a cancer drug that targets topoisomerase uh, and it is known as camptothecin, okay? So here's a, camptothecin is a, a naturally occurring molecule. Camptothecin has this very flat aromatic portion. What do you think that does in terms of interacting with DNA? It intercalates into the minor groove, exactly. So it's going to be stabilized by pi stacking interactions with the bases of the minor groove. But where it intercalates is at the spot where the chain has been temporarily broken. So that topoisomerase enzyme temporarily breaks, it cuts, cuts one of the chains, opens it up a little bit, and then in comes camptothecin. And then with it in there, the, the enzyme can no longer re-ligate the strand. So that's how it, it uh, destroys the DNA prevents it from replicating. Camptothecin itself is not a drug because it is too toxic and it is not soluble enough. So there are camptothecin derivatives that chemists in the pharmaceutical industry created uh, that are more water soluble. You can notice the presence of other functional groups that add water solubility uh, and they are also less toxic. Okay? And here we have a figure showing an x-ray crystal structure of topotecan, one of those drugs intercalated here you see where the strand was broken, that single strand break that was promoted by topoisomerase. And then you see the, can, the, the topotecan inserted in there, stabilized by pi stacking, stable enough in there that the enzyme's unable to close this back up. Question. Yeah, so you'd have to have a high enough concentration of the camptothecin so that it could insert itself in the open, the, the, the break, the broken strand prior to the topoisomerase being able to close it up, right? Uh, and it doesn't have to affect every single DNA strand in the cell. As long as you are uh, getting this in enough of those strands, you can prevent the replication and you can kill the cells. And so the clinical trials determine what the appropriate concentration of the drug is uh, to be able to affect enough of the DNA molecules. A very good question. Uh, so this is another uh, pi stacking phenomenon uh, where the uh, camptothecin and its derivatives can um, interfere with the replication process. Okay, so uh, when we don't have camptothecin around and we're able to have regular replication of DNA, uh, here's how the process proceeds. So uh, we have, we, we have the, the, the two strands. So remember, we, we have to unwind temporarily. This is the bubble that's going to appear in a certain part of the double helix. Uh, and we're going to make copies of each of the two strands of our DNA. Okay, but this is going to be complicated. It's more complicated uh, than it appears because the strands are anti-parallel. So the new strand is going to be assembled from the five prime to the three prime end, okay? Uh, and it's going to be assembled by SN2 chemistry. So your nucleotide that is going to be attached to the growing chain is going to have a triphosphate. It's gonna have a triphosphate on five prime. And then the three prime alcohol of your growing strand is just gonna attack that triphosphate displacing the diphosphate or pyrophosphate. We could call it OPP. Uh, we use that as a leaving group uh, on Wednesday when we were talking about lipids. Uh, so just to review what we're talking about here, you would have a molecule such as ATP, it would be DATP if you're making DNA, it wouldn't have the two prime OH, uh, but this would be the electrophilic end. And then a, a, a three prime nucleophile from the chain would come in and attack this phosphate displacing the diphosphate. So that's the chemistry, it's just SN2 chemistry, substitution chemistry that's building that chain. Uh, but we've got to start at the five prime end uh, and the five prime, whoops, let's go back. The five prime uh, nucleotide is gonna have a monophosphate on it. And then we keep adding these triphosphates one by one as we go down the, the strand, okay? 
But that gets complicated when we're looking at this strand down here. This one is, is known, so these are both template strands. And the one that just undergoes the normal uh, replication is called the leading strand. But this one down here, uh, we have to assemble in the five prime to three prime direction, but that's backwards from the direction in which we're unwinding. So if you're assembling in the backwards direction from which you're unwinding, you're only able to make short fragments of DNA uh, because you're doing it in the opposite direction of the unwinding. And those are known as Okazaki fragments, presumably after the scientist who discovered this phenomenon. And so on this, this is called the lagging strand, the one that's produced in these fragments. And there's an enzyme called DNA ligase that's then going to come along and ligate those uh, fragments together to make the full strand, okay? So the fact that the double helix is anti-parallel, but we can only unwind it in one direction makes it complicated to be able to replicate both strands at the same time, okay? Uh, any questions about how that uh, process is occurring? Okay. All right. So let's talk now about transcription. So transcription is the process by which RNA, specifically messenger RNA, is produced from DNA. Um, and it's going to be similar, but not the same. Uh, and some of the differences are going to come from differences between DNA and RNA. There are three key differences uh, between DNA and RNA. RNA has ribose instead of deoxyribose as the monosaccharide. And so the difference there is that ribose has a 2 prime OH group and deoxyribose does not. Okay. The other difference is RNA has uracil as one of its four bases, instead of thymine. So thymine has a methyl group that uracil does not. Okay, that's the only difference between those, uh, those structures is there's a missing methyl group uh, in the uracil. Uh, and then a third difference between DNA and RNA is that RNA does not form a double helix. Strands of RNA, nucleic acids, ribonucleic acids, are single-stranded. So that difference in structure, having this 2 prime OH, causes the, the biopolymer to have a different shape. It doesn't fold into this double helix. It is a single-stranded entity, and it forms a variety of shapes. There's a whole host of shapes that can be formed by RNA molecules. Uh, they tend to have helices in them. They tend to also have loops in them. So they form a variety of different structures. All right, now let's look at how the transcription process proceeds. Uh, and here we have a nice figure that shows that. For some reason, when it, the book showed replication, it showed it going from left to right. Here we're showing transcription going from right to left. I don't know why they made that switch, but, uh, uh, but in this particular example, uh, the double-stranded DNA is being transcribed from from left to right in this particular case. So the bubble is forming. We're unwinding and forming a bubble just like we would uh, in the case of uh, replication. But here we're only copying one of the two strands, okay? And remember that because RNA is much smaller than DNA, when we do this, we're only copying a small portion of a DNA molecule. This is not, this process is not gonna go all the way down the million strand million nucleotide DNA molecule. It's just going to do a few thousand, which is still a large number, but uh, comparatively small, a few thousand uh, uh, nucleotides in length, okay? And it's going to be a very similar process. We're going to unwind. Uh, we're going to go from five prime to three prime. We're going to use SN2 reactions between the ribonucleotides uh, to generate these, these uh, strands. Question. Um, it probably can form double strands in certain circumstances, but the vast majority of the time it is single stranded. Would it still form a double helix or make more of a different? Probably a different sort of uh, arrangement. It would not be the same as the double helix of DNA with the minor group. It's not going to be as well defined. So, whereas DNA structure is pretty well defined, RNA can form a variety of different structures. 
So then once the process is done, the DNA just forms its double helix again, and you have your RNA strand. So um, only one of the two strands is copied, uh, and that strand is referred to as the template strand. And so the new strand of RNA, this will be messenger RNA, uh, is going to be complementary to the template strand in terms of its base pairs that it contains. Uh, but it's going to be identical to the coding strand, the strand that is not copied, with the exception of having U instead of T. And we can see that uh, by looking at this figure here. Uh, here's our coding strand of DNA. This is the comp. This is the uh, mRNA. Sorry, this is the template strand, the one that was copied. This is the uh, sequence of mRNA that was copied from that template strand. These are complementary to each other in terms of their base pairs. Uh, and then you have the coding strand, complementary to the template, identical to the mRNA with the exception of the U's and T's, okay? Any question on the difference between template strands and coding strands? Okay, all right. So let's talk now about the translation process, our third process that uh, DNA can undergo. So translation, uh, is the, actually it's not the DNA that's undergoing it, it is the mRNA being translated into proteins, okay? Uh, so the mRNA, uh, as you probably learned in biology, is comprised of codons, so you take uh, every three base pairs, group the three, um, three nucleotides together on the strand, uh, and those three nucleotides uh, represent a codon. And you've probably seen charts like this. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize the genetic code uh, for this class. That would be a biology uh, assignment. Uh, but there are uh, 61 codons that code for various amino acids. There are only 20 amino acids, so some amino acids have more than one codon. There's anywhere from one to six codons for individual amino acids, depending on how highly represented they are in proteins. More common amino acids are gonna have more codons. Your less common amino acids and proteins will have fewer, right? Methionine, that's one of our most rare amino acids. It just has one codon. Uh, tryptophan is another one that's rare, it just has one codon. And then you've got three stop codons in there. Stop codons are the stop signals that signal that you've you're done with the, the, the protein uh, synthesis uh, and you're ready to cleave it from the ribosome. So the ribosome is the cellular machinery that synthesizes proteins. And the ribosome is made up of RNA. Uh, and, and it's fairly large, uh, uh, large machinery. So uh, what happens in the uh, translation process is it, it, is, it starts at the five prime end of your RNA molecule, your messenger RNA. It's read from the five prime end to the three prime end, okay? And the five prime end is going to represent the end terminus of your protein. And then the three prime end is gonna represent the C terminus. So this is backwards as to how we synthesize pro, uh, peptides and proteins in the lab. When we're using solid phase peptide synthesis, we start from the C terminus and go to the N terminus. But on the ribosome, it's opposite. We're going from N terminus to C terminus. All right, so how is this done? So we have tRNA plays a role in this, transfer RNA. And it tends to have this, uh, here's the, a three-dimensional shape. Here's how it gets represented in this kind of cloverleaf shape, indicating how it has these sheets and bends in it. So there's two key parts of the tRNA molecule. There's the anti-codon part, which is complementary to the codon from the mRNA. So it can base pair to the mRNA. And then there is the stem region here, which always has ACC at the, the three prime end. Uh, and your amino acid is gonna be attached to the adenine at the top here by an ester bond, okay? So we take a look here. There is an error in the slide. This is supposed to be a ribonucleotide. There's supposed to be an OH group here. So sorry about that. It's a new chapter in the book and they didn't catch that in the proofreading. Uh, but here you have an amino acid loaded on to the three prime hydroxyl 
uh, of this, this adenine, okay, or adenosine, I guess you would say, uh, loaded on by an ester. So that's formed by a nucleophilic acyl substitution. Um, you'll have an acyl phosphate. Remember acyl phosphates back from our um, chapter 16, I believe it was. Acyl phosphates are the biological version of acid chlorides or anhydrides. So nature makes an acyl phosphate from your amino acid, and then that acyl phosphate is attacked by the OH group to form an ester in just a nucleophilic acyl substitution process. So once we have the amino acid loaded onto the tRNA, the tRNA anticodons are uh, base pairing their hydrogen bonding with the complementary bases on the mRNA codons. And what this does is line up the amino acids. The amino acids in that protein chain just get lined up one next to another. Uh, and then we have a nucleophilic acyl substitution. We have an amine of a neighboring amino acid attacking the ester linkage that attaches that amino acid to the tRNA. So that's going to take it off the tRNA and then attach it to make a longer chain on this tRNA. And that process just goes on and on and on down the chain until we've added all of our amino acids by this nucleophilic acyl substitution process until we hit the stop codon. So what does the stop codon do? It doesn't just stop. If all it did was stop, then we would have our protein stuck on the ribosome. So it doesn't just stop. What it does is cleave the protein from the ribosome. Okay. So whereas all of our other our, our, our tRNA anticodons have amino acids attached, here uh, we just have a nucleophile that is capable of hydrolyzing, like a hydroxide or a bound water or something like that, that hydrolyzes the ester and releases the protein from the tRNA. And then the protein folds in solution. Okay, so that's the process. Any questions? Here's a slide that summarizes the relationship between the DNA, the RNA, the anticodons, and the peptides. That summarizes what we've talked about. We will finish uh, this on Monday and then discuss the um, discuss metabolism. Uh, you can turn in your census assignment and pick up a take-home quiz if you haven't already.